We've just really entered into something here, and uh, we've known it. We know it was coming. We knew, and we are. We've been searching our hearts. We've been repenting, and continue and ask the Lord to just be so present with you that He would remind you immediately if we offend, and walk in the Word, walk by the Spirit, ask Him how, spend time with Him. And it's not a checklist of things to do. No. It's a life. It's our life now. It's not, it's not religion anymore. No. It's our life. It's who we are. It's who we are. It's not just things that we do. It's who we are. Amen. We're priests and kings. We're prophets. We're prophets, priests, and kings unto our God. That's who we are. So you ready to go on? We'll get into a little bit stuff that's a little more fun? I like this too, like right? <laughs> okay, well, we're going to be uh, going on talking about miracles, but we're not. So <laughs> we're going to do what the Holy Spirit says we're going to do. So it, 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 we're leading up to talking about miracles. But there's a depth of miracles. I think he wants us to understand that we're going to walk in this depth that hasn't been seen before. So it's got to be rooted deep. Okay, and, we're gonna, and you're going to see how that ha is going to happen. So we're we've been talking about the power gifts, the gift of faith, the working of miracles, and we're going to be talking soon about, maybe soon, about the gifts of healing. I'm starting to not second guess him anymore. Um, the gifts overlap, especially in their category, right? All the gifts of the Spirit overlap, especially within their category, but they can slip out into the other categories as well. The gift of faith is a supernatural deposit of God's own confidence that he gives, us, gives to us to accomplish his purpose for that moment. The gift of faith is manifested as a catalyst for power when working with the other two power gifts, miracles and healings. Okay. Okay. There you go. Uh, we should never work in the gifts outside of the principles of God. What does that mean? That means we don't get into witchcraft. That means we're submitted to him, that we're going to do it his way, the way he tells us to do it, right? We're going to be obedient to him, and we're not going to be doing it for our own gain or our own fame. We're going to be doing it for his purpose, purpose prophetic destiny. Amen. Working in the gifts is for the common good. It's to display God's almighty power and for prophetic destiny. Nothing screws people up more than miracles. Why? Immaturity. Not normal. Immaturity. What do people start doing? Looking at us. Seeking the miracle. Seeking the miracle, right? Not seeking God. Looking at the person yeah, performing the miracle, yeah. right? And not the real person performing the miracle, yeah. who is right. the Holy Spirit, by the way. True. That's right. He is the power of God. We talked about Brownsville and the revival there and why it ended and some of the flesh that got involved. And not to point fingers at, at them because I, I listened to Michael Brown talk about it, the immense pressure uh, work involved. Intense. My heart went out to them. I mean, I'm, I'm like, woo! Intense. Intense. The failure to keep God centered, the, car the carnality not dealt with, disunity, and false accusation, and we better take heed to that because this is the first thing the devil will do to stop, thwart the plans of God. He just brings a little disunity between the brothers, and that's it. That's the end of it. End of story. So we always fight for unity. Um, money issues and controlling spirits. And, you know, anytime something starts taking off and uh, you have controlling spirits around, they want to somehow get control of it. It's demonic entities. So revivals end because of flesh, right? We fall because of flesh, disobedience, right? We must walk in the spirit and the word and strive for unity. And if we could just do this, that would be the biggest part of the obstacle that would be against us in revival. We've been praying for the fire of revival, right? But have we been preparing for revival? Walking in the spirit and the word and striving for unity. We've got to do that. I pray revival doesn't hit until the church is ready. 
And I believe that's what the Father is saying to us, is that he wants to prepare a people to carry his glory. The ark, the ark and the real ark of the covenant, uh, they don't know where it is, right? No, they In Jerusalem, right? They don't know where it is. They do. Well, they think they do, right? But we don't know for sure. They're not saying that they know that they have it anyway. It's, it's non-existent. And I think that speaks to the church. The real church is like non-existent in the world. We're, we're, a, uh, we're a parody of ourselves, right? Now, does that sound, it sounds a little harsh, but uh, it's the truth. It's the truth. The power has got to come back to the church. And, you know, his basic doctrines of taking care of one another, of preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out devils, right? Preaching the true word of God, not watering it down. Right. Preaching holiness, all of those things have to come back. And I think we're going to see the Ark of the Covenant, meaning the church, the temple of God, is going to be resurrected. And I'm not talking about the temple in Israel. I'm talking about his, his temple. We're his temple, yeah, that's right. Right? That's right? And it is going to be resurrected. I believe it already is. Amen. Uh, it's starting. It, I, yeah, it's, it's not. We're starting. It's alive. It's alive. We're it's starting. Alive. And there's, there's, there's a rumbling, like Brian, you prophesied. There's a rumbling going on. We can feel it. It's, it's happening. It's happening. I know it's happening in me. I feel totally different. I, 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 something happened. But remember that revival. We talked about how messy and inconvenient it is. And it's a temptation for evil. It's work, right? Yeah. Leaders must be mature in the ways of the Lord, have the fear of the Lord, be sold out for the Lord, accountable to each other, be jealous over the things of God and not each other. Ah, that's good. That would be good if we could walk in that. That would be one step up. And they must deal with the serpent. We've got to know our enemy. And I am so happy because Keith's next conference is going to be all about exposing who our enemy really is. And it's not each other. The fire of revival brings chaos. So you know what? We have to bring order, right? It brings crazies. So we need to know how to deliver those crazies. It brings control freaks. We've got to know how to bind Jezebel. The miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead led to the Pharisees' plot to kill Jesus. So when we start doing the miracles, guess who's going to come against us? The Pharisees. The Pharisees. The All hell is going to break loose. The organized church. The organized the church. Is that That's right. The chaos from the fire, fire of revival. Yeah, because because when people start coming in, people start coming in. It's like a logistics issue. It's chaotic, um, and we've got to have people in place for that kind of stuff right. and God is raising up those people so fire brings persecution purity and preparation and that's what we've got to go through right now so that we can get to revival because if we don't go through this it's going to fail again yeah. yet again people will start missing their own church services and that starts the jealousy oh see oh I didn't think about that people I'm going to put it on the camera uh, people will start missing their church services because there might be a revival across town mm -hmm. and then their church becomes jealous. Instead of the pastor saying, hey, there's a revival going on over here and we're all going. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we want to go where God goes. It doesn't matter where it happens. Aren't we one? Isn't the church one? No. Well, it is. They just don't know it. Right? We're in the mikvah of fire and it leads to the mikvah of suffering and which leads to the mikvah of glory. So you can't get to the glory without the fire, can't get to the fire, to the glory without the suffering, you can't get to the suffering without the fire. And we're gonna stay in this loop of fire and suffering and persecution and glory, and it'll be a loop until Jesus comes. Okay, because we're gonna see lots of glory. The baptism of fire will transform us and sanctify us and prepare us to be the bride. That's, that's what the goal is. Jesus is not a pedophile. No. Jesus is not going to marry a child bride. Jesus is going to come back for a mature bride without spot or wrinkle. A, fi a bride fit for a king. Amen. Amen? So we have to go through sanctification. We have work to do. We have work to do. 
Told you it was going to be like boot camp tonight. We will be transformed into his image for the greater works in these final days. It is our prophetic destiny. It is what we've been born to do. Yes. It's what we, let me say it again. It's what we've been born to do. And it's necessary for the end time harvest and the preservation of God's people in the most difficult times in all of earth's history. It's true. I believe that. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're coming on it. Without a clo close relationship with him, a complete submission to him, without facing the fire always, and without seeking his kingdom first, we will not see the glory of God. True. And I am just jealous over it. I want to see it. Yeah. I want to be in it. I don't just want to watch from the sidelines. Amen. Put me in, coach. Amen. Put me in. That's right. So now we're going, going on to part two of workings of miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, power Man, gifts. Those reviews are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here we're going on some rabbit trails, Lisa. So you are you are really good at this. So you will be able to follow closely. But the rest of you, you look to Lisa, right? Okay, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 10 because this is our scripture. To another was given the working of miracles. When, the, when he, Paul was explaining the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he said, to another, the workings of miracles, along with all the other gifts given to people. But in the Greek, it says, to someone else, the Holy Spirit imparts supernatural miracle power. Supernatural miracle power. Sounds like a shame. Say it. Supernatural, supernatural miracle supernatural power. Miracle supernatural power. miracle power. Supernatural miracle power. Supernatural miracle power. Better. Wow. Miraculum. Wonder at. We will be doing wonders and people will wonder, how did you do that? And our answer is, well, I didn't do it. Yes. Holy Spirit did it because I'm a believer in Jesus and filled with his spirit. Amen. Easy your, story. Uh, take your eyes off. Yeah, you. Take, yeah, look at him. It's for a wonder and a sign that he is the almighty. That's what we're supposed to be representing. representing. We don't start doing miracles so we can have a miracle ministry. The goal is to do miracles so that God can be exalted in the land. Will he find those people? Yes. We will be those people. We will be those people, Mike. After I'm done with you, Mike, we will be those people. The word in the Greek here is energemata dyna meon. Operations of power, energizing of powerful works. I'm talking about energizing powerful works. Mm, ever ready. Back. Ever ready. That's right. So the definition is supernatural endowment imparted by God to work a miracle by which natural laws are altered, suspended, or controlled. We don't, we are not of this world. We are not limited to the things of this world, right? right? We are children of the most high God. But we limit ourselves. We limit ourselves. That's where the limitation comes. And if we, if, and the devil has nothing to do with it unless we allow him to convince us that we can't do it. That's right. That's the only thing he can do is deceive. And then we open our mouth and actually say that we can't. Right. Right. Oh, we got to come up to a higher place. That's right. We are coming into. We're coming into that area where the veil is getting thin on the seventh day. And we're beginning to see who we really are. Stop it. I'm going to go. I gotta go. I'm going to go forward, so i got to keep to my notes here. Okay, Acts 15, 12. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Uh, among, the, among the church? Signs and wonders done among the church? No. Unbelievers. Thank you. Signs and wonders done among the Gentiles. We got to go out. We got to get out of our churches. We got to stop being afraid of man and start laying hands on the sick. Right? Oh, I need some amens. This is good preaching. 
They look so different out there. They're so ready. <laughs> yeah. But they come in different colors, shapes, yeah. sizes. Yeah. Yeah. Male, female. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's all kinds out there that need God. Catholics, everything. You name it. So the word Simeon in the Greek um, is a sign. This is what this word is, signs, Simeon, a sign, mark, or token. And it's used of miracles and wonders as signs of divine authority. It's a sign of divine authority. Do you see yourself walking in divine authority? Absolutely. Oh, we better. We got to see ourselves walking in his divine nature with his divine authority. What do you think Jesus did? He died to give us authority to take back what Adam had lost so that we could have dominion over the earth. But the devil all this time has told us we are nothing, we are nobody, we can do nothing. But with him, we can do all things. Amen. And that's Why what... Do we do that? Because we don't believe it. We don't we believe, believe it. We believe in but I'm God. telling you, you've got to start believing it. We We're going to go God. forward. Supernatural intervention by God in the ordinary course of nature. We're able to come into a situation in the earth and we're able to change it completely because we're walking in divine authority. We bring God into the situation and he changes it through us. It's the same root word that is used in Hebrews 6, 5 to speak of the powers of the age to come. The powers of the age to come, dynamaeus. And remember, we talked about dynamo and intergenomatic or whatever it was. Okay, the powers of the age to come. And because we're seeing into the seventh day, that's the age to come, we're tasting of some of the things that are coming in the seventh day. We're beginning to taste it and see it. At least I am. Oh, yeah. I'm seeing it. Dynamis te melantos ayanos, deed of power, miracle and wonder he's given us a deed he's giving us a deed saying you can you are the inheritors of power and miracles and wonders yeah. he's given us the deed how did he do that through the holy spirit through the gift of the holy spirit given to us the same original power that adam possessed before the fall in edom Adam had complete dominion, authority over all the beasts of the earth. But through sin, he lost his authority and dominion. But through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, he's given us back the authority and dominion over all the earth. Because we know him. Because now he's not just God's man on the earth. We become the bride of Christ. Christ is God. Do you see this? But Adam had God with him on the earth, right? Yes, God walked with him. He was his... So he didn't need the Holy Spirit. He, didn't need he had the Spirit, actually, because God's presence was all in him. He blew into him. He gave him the breath of life. That is the Holy Spirit. But the only thing that Adam didn't have that we can have is that one day we will be the bride of Christ. Regarding times past, Adam, or possessing time future, the age to come, <coughs> there's no time or distance in the spirit. So through Christ, we are in the second Adam, and we are now partakers of the powers of the age to come. If we're walking in the spirit where there is no time, no past, no present, no future, we're all there with God, God's in it all, all the time, then we can now be partakers of the powers of the age to come. And we saw how Jesus was able to do this before he was resurrected. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he raised the dead before he was resurrected, right? He was living in his future. He was saying, I see that. That is my destiny. So I'm going to go into my destiny, take it back for right now. Because walking in the spirit, there's no time or distance. Is that why the, the Pharisees, Sadducees got so upset with him raising Lazarus? Because oh, they yeah. saw it? They, they, he had power over death, 
What is this? Right, they saw it. Yeah, they, have, they can't control somebody like that. And him saying, on the third day I will rise again. That's right. Was just like them That's right. launching a space shuttle right. of anger and right. the church and coming out. Yeah, and we're going to see... Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. And we're going to see this past, present, and future okay. again as we go on here. Because the transfiguration was also about past, present, and future. We're going to see that. Hebrews 6, 1 through 6. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. That's the destiny. Maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Are we done with that? Are we done with dead works? Oh, absolutely. Okay, amen. And faith in God. Have we, have we decided we're going to trust him? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, faith in God. Instruction about baptisms. Have I taught you about the baptisms? Yeah. Not a thing, right? Right. So we understand the baptisms. Um, the laying on of hands. Do we understand the laying on of hands? Yeah. The resurrection of the dead. Do we believe that we are going to be resurrected? Yes. Yes. Do we believe, do we believe that through Christ we have power over death, hell, and the grave? Yes. Amen. Amen. That's right. We need, and you know what? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm trying. I'm I am going to believe it. I'm telling myself, Allison, believe this. Get out of the way, Because it's true. I'm headed that way. Get and way. eternal judgment. Do we know that the eternal judgment is coming? Oh, yeah. Do you have the fear of the Lord? Yes. 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 And this we will do if God permits. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. So it's possible we can taste the power of the age to come and then have fallen away to be restored again to repentance because they themselves are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to open shame. So let's look at this. Have we been enlightened? Yes. Our eyes have been opened, right? We know, we know who we are. We know that we're in Jesus. We know Jesus is the Son of God. He was raised from the dead, he, right? He sits at the right hand of God. He's made a place for us. We know and we serve him. Have we tasted of the heavenly gift? We have received Jesus. Amen. And we have received the Holy Spirit. Yes. We shared in the Holy Spirit, not just sealed. Here we were sealed by the Holy Spirit. But here, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, we are filled, baptized, fully immersed, fully infilled with him. And there should be evidence of that. There should be an outflow of the Holy Spirit in your life. Have we tasted the goodness of the word of God? Yes. yes. Have we been taught and we understand that the word uh, by the Holy Spirit, that he reveals, the spirit of revelation and understanding reveals God's word to us so that we can be partakers of the word. Do we get that? Amen. Yes. And have we tasted in the powers of the age to come? Just a little bit. That's where we are, people. Right here. We are going to taste the power of the age to come. There's little bits and pieces that we taste once in a while. It's like, oh, wow, this must be what it's going to be like in heaven. This is going to be, oh, Jesus, I feel your presence so strong. It's like I'm already there with you. We're beginning to, we're beginning to see and taste the powers of the age to come. Part of it is we think about leading people to Jesus when if we would just walk in the power of the age to come, it would reveal him. Yes. And they would come to him. Thank you. That's what I'm getting at. We're from the kingdom of God. The, the bringing the kingdom of God to them. That's right. So that's where we are. We are going to start working in the powers of the age to come. But you know what? The warning is if you taste of all these things and then you turn again away from him, there's no coming back. So the fear of the Lord better be upon us all as we enter into tasting the powers of the age to come. So something incredible is happening to the remnant. Amen. Amen. Something incredible is happening. I feel it. It's the rumbling. We all feel it. Miracles are part of tasting the powers of the age to come. Walking in them. Walking in it. Not just sporadically wondering how did that happen, but actually walking in it. Hearing from heaven and doing what the Father says to do. 
Remember we discussed how Jesus lived the resurrection and, and he said he was the resurrection and the life long before he was resurrected. He proclaimed himself the resurrection when? When he raised Lazarus from the dead, right? Before he had died and been resurrected. But he had already raised someone from the dead, Jairus' daughter. We see this um, same thing when he raises Jairus' daughter. And there's a difference between the two because here he was tasting, here he knew exactly who he was. I'll show you. It's interesting. So in Mark 5, 21 through 24, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Then it goes on in verses 25 through 34 to he encounters the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. And then it picks up back in 35. The encounter continues. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Do, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't, don't, don't entertain fear and thoughts of fear, just believe me. Wow. That's so important for us. Yes. We can't walk in fear and faith at the same time. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly. I've seen this in the hospital. It's crazy wild. We went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he put them all out of the house. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talaith kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. There's something going on there with the whole 12. 12 is what? Governmental authority. At this time, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So here, he wasn't proclaiming himself the resurrection and the life. Here, he was working in miracles. Look how short, direct, and to the point. It wasn't no long, exacerbated prayer no. You're just showing me right here, he said yeah. two words. Two words, yeah. Period. And she responded. And so the power was so strong and so fearless yeah. and so full of faith right. that two words, two words changed this whole dynamic. Well, we see how Jesus lived his life. That's the whole key. He didn't waste words. Well, he didn't. He, he spoke a lot of words, Mike. But here's the deal. He lived them. That's the key. He lived it. He believed it. He submitted to the Father. That is the pattern. We have to do that to get to that. But the disciples were right there with him. They yes. saw and they witnessed. They saw. But they still staggered with they, the thought of yes. misunderstanding and saying, yes. like, what's it going to be like in heaven? Or yeah. who among us? Yeah, they weren't, they weren't aware at all they yet. Try, but they right. were, you know, they were right there. Well, he brought them there to see it so that they could start believing. Right? Yes. So Peter, James, and John, that's who he brought. And Jesus allowed them to witness the resurrection power at least twice. Once here and then with... Lazarus. Mark 8 says, In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. 
And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in, in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people and they set them before the crowd and they had a few small fish and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them and they ate and were satisfied and they took up broken pieces left over seven baskets full from seven fish and two loaves, they ended up with seven baskets full left over. And there were about 4,000 people and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with And Satan fell, Jesus was there. He Jesus him saw fall. him fall over and over to Mount Hermon, at the time of his ascension, I'm telling you, what? Please pass, pass the rocket fuel. I know, right? <laughs> I know. He has given us his authority. Jesus has given us his authority. It's not our own. It's his because we're in him. Yes. Look, what's your name? Oh, Mike. No, what's your name? What's your name? Jesus. Jesus. We are Jesus on the earth, right? We're in him. We're in his name. He's given us his name. Yes. See, that's a deal. We're no longer us. We're no longer us. Especially since we died to ourselves. We, yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Thank you. We died to us. We died to this. And we live for him in his name, by his authority, his power. Right? We have no name in Thank you. Of the Most High God, Thank you. Living in power through him. Yes. Stephanie, get over here and take my place. Will you please? What I keep really going back to though is he's telling the disciples, I saw Satan fall. You've got right. to know who I am. Yes, exactly. He is the Almighty. And Grayson informed me that this title, the Almighty, is used more for God in the Bible than any other title. Mm. Thank you, Gray. The believer who is fully conscious, fully conscious of divine power behind him and of his own authority thereby can face the enemy without fear or hesitation. Once we know that, once we really know that, we can walk without fear or hesitation. Be, now, this is, these are great quotes, and I'm going to tell you who they're from. So, the believer who is fully conscious of divine power behind him and of his own authority, thereby can face the enemy without fear or hesitation. Think about who might have said that. Oh, you're so close. Behind the authority possessed by the believer, there is a power infinitely greater than that which backs his enemies and which they are compelled to recognize. His enemies are compelled to recognize that Jesus' authority is far above his. Right? Am I saying that right? Do you get it? Behind the authority possessed by the believer... There is a power infinitely greater than that which backs his enemies and which they are compelled to recognize. That's why when we say, Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ, yeah. they are compelled to recognize our authority. Right? And the last quote I'm going to share is, we have become a full partaker of Christ's righteousness, his throne, his name, his authority, his power, his spirit, and his ministry. That's a lot. We got we to gotta, we gotta believe this. We have to walk in this. And this came, you, you guessed so close. Kenneth Hagin read this man's book, and that's how he learned about the believer's authority. It's the, uh, the authority of the believer by John McMillan in 1932. He was a holy 49 year old Presbyterian businessman with a missionary call to China and the Jews and others. And it's a great book, I downloaded it. Um, it's only about, we're only about 100 years behind him. 
Okay? I mean, he knew this then. He had a revelation of this in 1932. And we're just like, uh, what? Uh, who are we? Uh, what? Oh, wow, I'm just, a, I'm just a little old sinner saved by grace. Right? So download, you can download the PDF for free on nwcbooks.com. Or you could go to Amazon Kindle for 99 cents and download it onto your Kindle. And um, I've, been, I've been reading it. And it's interesting that I, I found this because I watched a message by Billy Brim talking about uh, we're in the transition. And it's a great message. Um, and it was confirmed to me because the Lord told me that we were in transition in 2016, he said, you're in transition. I'm turning my face towards Israel and go read Jehu. And so I've known we were in the transition for a while now, but it's nice to have somebody else of the other prophets saying, yes, it's time. It's the time of the transition. So something wonderful is happening to the remnant. The remnant uh, is defined by Dr. Michael Lake. Is the remnant is, com is comprised of those who have a true heart for God and a deep desire to be faithful to him alone, regardless of the cost. This can prophetically include those that are in some type of spiritual bondage that frustrates this holy desire within them. As the kingdom is manifested and decreed, destruction is released upon the enemies of God. His remnant will experience salvation and deliverance that enable them to serve their king unfettered. So we're coming into a time that his people, his remnant people, are walking with him uh, no matter what the cost is, that we're turning our face to the fire, but also remember that he's calling in the prodigals who are also part of the remnant. He's going to start calling the, the members of, that are part of the remnant that are in debt.